Let me ask you a question as we get started. Thank you guys for coming tonight. You that are joining us on the internet, thank you guys for coming. We're going to be diving into the second chapter of the epistle of 1 John. Anybody been enjoying this? Anybody been tolerating this? <laughs> you know, keep, keep the shovel sharp. Keep, keep digging and digging and digging. I tell you what, as you, I've said for years, you get into the Word, the Word gets into you. You know, it, it, it affects you and it infects you with something. It's, it's contagious inside and you just want to keep getting in. Let me ask you this tonight. How many of you here tonight desire to be in the will of God? Anybody not desire to be in the will of God? <laughs> Back off three steps from it because it may be coming. You, you know, I, I ask that, and I want to ask a follow-up question on top of that one is, what is the will of God for your life? Now, the first question is easy. Oh, it's just a yes, no. Do you want to be in the will of God? And everyone is immediately going to raise up their hand and say yes. But if I put everyone on the spot tonight, and, and, and rest easy tonight, I'm not going to do this to you. Maybe. It's easy. If I ask you to take just a blank sheet of paper and write God's will for your life on it in 90 seconds, would there be much hesitation? Probably some people would. You'd be thinking, oh, what is the will of God in my life? How am I going to determine those things? You know you're going to get a number of answers. But the thing about it is, is what I found when I've asked people questions like that, or I've even tried to ponder it in my mind time and time again, sometimes when we think about what's God's will for our life, we focus more on our circumstances than we do God's will. And so we think about what's God's will. Well, when we, we, we reduce it down to, I wonder if he wants me, to, if it's God's will for me to buy that car. I wonder if it's God's will for me to move to that particular city. I wonder if it's God's will for all of these things. And when it becomes that, folks, it really ceases to be about God's will, and it becomes about our desires. You know, what's interesting about that is this past week, and, you know, I was just, I was talking to Melanie about this, and it's out of the book of, of Genesis, and I'm sure having to tie this together here in a second in Genesis chapter 22. You put your finger there. I'll get there in just a second. But, you know, what has happened in people's lives, churches, ministries, we, we, most of us have been around a number of things for long enough, if we find out that there's something that's happened, here's what people have attempted to do. They've either tried to hide, insulate, or disguise their own disobedience behind a little phrase called, well, it just was or wasn't the will of God. Something bad happens, and we say to ourselves, well, that just wasn't God's will. Or something good happens, or, or something happens different than what we prescribe, we say, well, that just must have been God's will. And so our out is always just this, that was just God's will, or that was just not God's will. And you know, folks, I, I want to I warn you about something. You know, we think about that God will not hold them blameless that take his name in vain. You know, you don't have to drop some type of profanity-laced tirade with God's name attached to it, or the name of Jesus, to be taking his name in vain. When we attribute things to him that he never said, or it wasn't his heart, that is taking his name in vain, using it as something that's that's vain or vanity towards those things. And so I, I just want to caution you as a group, you as a people who listen to this, watch using God's will to disguise those things in your life that have nothing to do with God's will. Or B, what we do is we attempt to justify our sin by stating that God is in control and that something we did must have been his will. Let me ask you a question again. Is God's will always accomplished? It is. God's will is always accomplished. Well, I got I got somebody that says here off camera, so you don't you won't see her on this. If I'm so here's what the Bible says that it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Are any people going to perish? So God's will is that none. So some are. So does God's will always get accomplished? You can't get around that one, can you? Why do we always want to answer yes to that? Because we think God's will is always done. It's God's will for a child to be abused. It's not his will. And so does that happen? So does God's will always get done? It's not his will, but it still happens. It's that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. So whatever it is, but those things still happen. Why? Because once man fell, man fell out of the realm of God's will and it fell into man's way. And so how do we get back into God's will? Well, one day that's going to be accomplished in totality, but now we still see through a glass darkly. 
But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done, uh, done away with. So right now, God's will is done in our hearts and lives in totality, seated with him in heavenly places, prophetically. But all in all, it's not always done. Why? Because he's still functioning through, through vehicles or people that do not always submit to his will. Because there's things we do and we go through that have nothing to do with God's will and they have something to do with our rebellion. And so this, you know, the last few weeks, you know, we've looked really at length into kind of this foundational message that First John has established for us uh, through the, the Apostle John. And, you know, he was speaking to the, this early church. We talked about this because of the, the Gnostics attempt to really to heretically influence the gospel message. And so the, the summarization of this message was found right there in, in chapter 1, verse 6. It said, if we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness, then we do not, we lie and do not the truth. And the problem that was faced then, that's faced now, it's that there's been an out-of-balance focus on this issue of justification, and we've almost totally eliminated that subsequent process of sanctification. And folks, you know the reason that happens a lot of times is because we get outside the will of God. And I told you to put your finger right there on Genesis chapter 22. You guys know the story of the promises that God made to Abraham, and he told him that you're Seed is going to be like the sand of the sea. He gave him this promise, and, you know, he, he didn't believe the promise. He said, well, I'm too old. His wife is too old. And, and they didn't believe that they could have this offspring. And so what ended up happening? You remember the story. And Sarah said, hey, listen, you know what? Evidently, it's not going to happen the way that we hope because I'm too old. So let me let me get this, use a Kentucky phrase, let me get this old gal that is a, uh, that's my servant, my maid servant, and we'll just have offspring through her. So you know the story that, you know, uh, he went under to Hagar, and they produced this child named what? Ishmael. Does anyone remember what Ishmael means? Now, they named that child Ishmael. What does Ishmael mean? It means God hears. God hears. Now, think about how what's so ironic about that. Now, many times when we get outside of God's will, we begin to say, well, God hears. God knows. You know, God's the one that heard me. God's the one that, that knew what I was going through. God's the one that delivered the Well, the Bible says this, and we see it in, in what Peter wrote. He said, listen, the, the, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. He said, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God don't hear we know what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He says that God's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save. His ear is not heavy, that he cannot hear. But it's your iniquities. It's you getting outside of God's will that has kept him from hearing your prayer, that he don't hear you any longer. And so we see many times, and here's what's interesting about this, and here's what he told later on after uh, Isaac had been born in, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. You know the story when he told him, I want you to go up and take your son. He said, now, he said, take now your son, your only son. Take now your son. Now, I don't know how many times I've, I've read that. And it just never jumped out at me like that. Because, you know, we'd say to ourselves, well, he, he had another son. And we'd say his name was Ishmael. His name was, well, God heard me, but I needed it. Well, evidently, God didn't hear that. And evidently, God didn't recognize that. Even though Ishmael might have came from his physical loins, God didn't even recognize the fact that he had, quote, unquote, another biological child. Because it's interesting that he brought the point, he said, take your son, not your youngest son or your child of promise. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son. And so the question that's posed to us regarding God's will, and as we're looking at the second uh, chapter of the book of First John is this. How long are we going to try to pass off our sin as his son? Because had Ishmael been the one carried up there, there would not have been a ram in the bush. That knife would have met his throat and there would have been a sacrifice up there. And people said, well, that was a horrible situation. Why? Because that was just sin and the wages or the consequence of sin is going to be death. But the consequence of a promise is life everlasting. And so, folks, listen, when we try to take our sin and lay it upon an altar and present it to him, what's going to happen? Death is going to happen. Unmet expectations are going to happen. Disappointment's going to happen. 
We're going to flounder in our call. We're going to say all these things. And we're going to shake our fist at God and say, God, why didn't you hear? Didn't you see I had Ishmael there? And he's like, well, I didn't ask you for your sin, your disobedience outside of my will. I asked you for your son. I ask you for that thing that is the product of my promise, not your presumption. And so, folks, when we come into this epistle of 1 John, that's exactly what he was leading up to. Justification is part to give you a promise, but sanctification is finally coming to the place of realization that we've got to hear him, not to hear something that we've tried to pass off time and time again as his voice. So what's God saying to us? Well, justification begins, it, it, here's what it is, it's the initial step of faith, saving faith that reconciles us back to the Father. That's what it is, it's that initial step of faith, saving faith that reconciles us back to the Father through, I'll give you a couple things right now, A, repentance from dead works, our sins, our will. Those things that we tried to pass off and say this had to be God, and when it wasn't happening the way we thought, we shook our fist at heaven. And B, A, repentance from dead works, B, faith towards God, or reliance upon the finished work of the cross to pay sin's debt. That's what justification is. It's heavily weighted upon the side of God. He said, I loved you so much that I gave my son that whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. And so God's part was, I loved you so much that I gave my son. And if you believe, that's justification, then you will have, what? Eternal life. Folks, when does eternity start? It starts now, doesn't it? Now, our eternal life isn't going to happen the day where, when, when, when that eastern sky is, is, is parted or we're caught up together with him in the air. Well, that's not when eternity starts. Eternity, eternal life starts for the believer the day that the believer asks the Lord Jesus Christ to come into his heart life. Life comes into me. I'm now crucified with him in the life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Not later on, and I'm just some, still some old wicked sinner saved by grace. Immediately there's a transformation that comes into my heart and life that brings the, the, the action, it brings the anointing, it brings the presence of God and the effects of eternal life into me right now. And so if I believe upon him, I will not perish, but I will have now eternal life. Now, what does eternal life look like in a word? It looks like Jesus. I'm going to have the character and the nature of Christ dwelling inside of me that's going to produce the fruit of that relationship in and of my life. Something is going to be different about me. Why? So I can walk in the will of God. So that's where justification is. Sanctification is this. It's the process by which we put off the old man or that old sin nature, that thing that can't help it, and we walk upright and holy through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, that washing of the word and obedience to God's directive. So sanctification is when we get rid of the old things, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and everything becomes new. That's what sanctification looks like. It looks like something new. It's not just a patch job. It's just not putting a, 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 a patch on a, an old wine skin and, and, and hoping for the best or, or retreading the tire. That's not what sanctification is. Sanctification means that I think differently because I am different. I live different because I am different. I speak different because I am different. It's not something that I do. It's who I am. I'm sanctified because I was justified and transformed by the redeeming faith in the finished work of the cross. Sanctification, write this down, is no accident. It's an action. Sanctification is no accident sanctification it's an action an action is enabled by the very fact that we've been justified by faith and are now empowered to live like it that's what sanctification is it's the very fact that we're enabled through justification and in fact to live like we're now sanctified any gospel that offers salvation without the expectation of subsequent transformation is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. Any gospel that offers salvation without the expectation of, of a subsequent or afterward transformation is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is derived from the one that's eternal to transform us into somebody that's going to live with him for eternity. It's going to put off the old man and put on the new. 
And so here's my question to you tonight. Do you want to know God's will for your life? You want to walk in God's will? Yes. You know God's will? Sometimes, yes, I do. I think I do. I, I thought I did a minute ago until you, until you pulled the plug on me on that. But do you want to go know God's will for your life? Somebody say amen. I'm glad you did. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says this. It says for this. Somebody say this. For this. for this is the will of God. Oh, I'm perking my ears up. Man, God, I want to walk in your will. What is the will of God? Well, good news. Paul the Apostle lets us in on it. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. You want to know what the will of God looks like? It looks like people walking sanctified. It looks like people walking holy. It looks like people walking in obedience to him. You want to know your will, the will of God is? It's not going to be determined where if you move off to China and preach the gospel. That's not where the will of God is going to be determined. The will of God is not whether or not you reach in your pocket and you pull out a $10 bill and give it to some uh, homeless Vietnam vet on the corner. That's not going to determine the will of God. Lost people do that all the time. The will of God is not going to be whether you have the nice smile on your face and uh, you have a good time. The will of God is being holy as he is holy and walking in sanctification. It's not being a part of the right club, the right church, the right ministry, the right denomination. It's being holy. At the end of your life, he looks into you and he sees the commandment manifest in your life to be holy as he is holy. That's the will of God. It's not that you get the right husband, the right wife, the right job. You have the, the, the smiling kid with the perfect teeth. That's not the will of God, how it's going to be manifested in your life. The will of God is this, your sanctification. You know, for me, folks, that makes it so easy for me to serve God. It does. It makes it so simple because I'm not sitting there thinking to myself all the time, oh, man, I hope I don't take a misstep and, and somehow disobey what God is saying. He's like, son, just be holy. Live sanctified. Live righteous. And wherever you go, whatever you do, whether it's eating a hamburger or, 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 or going to preach on the streets, Live sanctified. Live, live holy, and you're going to represent my will. You're going to do it wherever you are, whatever you go. If you're in school, if you're not in school, if you've got this job or you got that job or whatever else, just live sanctified, and you can rest assured that you're not juggling all these plates of circumstance thinking, man, I hope this is the right thing. Folks, all of those things are temporal. God's will is eternal. Do you hear me? We've got to stop calling those things that are so temporal the quote-unquote the will of God. God's will is always those things that are eternal. And if it's not eternal, just chalk that up for a choice and an opportunity. Let's not try to call it the will of God to somehow buy ourselves out of a situation and call ourselves Ishmael or God hears me, God knows. Well, take your son, your only son, and stop trying to offer your sin or your self-will or your own mentality, your own opinions, offering them up to me. Sanctification literally means the process of making or becoming holy. It's to be set apart. It's to be consecrated to him. So, folks, the will of God for every. Somebody say every. So this, don't say this is for Pastor Troy or for Gideon over here or for Pastor Sam or for Bobby back here. Don't, don't just say the will of God. The, the will of God for every blood-bought, born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is us to be holy, to live holy, to act holy, to talk holy, to think holy, to do holy. That's what the will of God is, is to be those things that are representative of his character. This was and is the way it has always been with God. Folks, that did not ever change from the very beginning. That's been God's desire. From the beginning, when they walked with him in the cool of the day, they could do that. Why? Because they were holy. They were consecrated unto him. What happened once they got out of his will and they disobeyed him? They were put out of the garden. It was blocked. They did not have that. And so Jesus Christ came to reconcile us back unto the Father through coming as God with us to die a death for us, to dwell inside of us, that if he be lifted up, he'll draw us together with him. Now we can identify with him justification to be holy with him through that process of sanctification. Folks, under the law, it was the same way. Look at Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus 20, 7 and 8. 
He said this, sanctify yourselves, therefore. But that was under the law. Absolutely. Because God's precepts, God's requirements have never changed. Sanctify yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you will keep my statutes, and you will do them, and I am the Lord which sanctifies you. That's what he said, under the law. Now let's look under the covenant of grace, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 16. 14 through 16, he said this, as obedient children. What kind of children? Not disobedient children, but obedient children. He said, not fastening yourselves according to your former lust, who you used to be in your ignorance. I mean, don't you like how he just breaks it down? Listen, your problem was you were ignorant. The problem is you didn't know, and people perish because of what? A lack of knowledge, because of their ignorance. But if a man desires to be ignorant, let him remain ignorant. Now, you don't desire to be ignorant any longer. We desire to have the mind of Christ. He said, that's how you used to be fashioned, your formal lust, your, your ignorance. You didn't know. You didn't, have the, you didn't have the capacity towards faith because you had not heard the word. But as he which has called you is holy, not does holy, is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation literally means the conduct of your life. And everything about you be Holy. A guy came up to me just the other night on the street, 30 years old, claimed to be a believer, came from a Roman Catholic background. And he came up to me and he said, I, he said, really, I can't deny what you're telling me. I believe it. And I told him, I said, well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us to be holy. It tells us what fellowship does light have with darkness. He said, the, the, the only problem I run aground with is he says, but he, he said, because there's this one area that I can't conquer. He said, it's not drinking. He said, it's not women. He says, he said, I just like to make money. And I said, well, how does that interfere? He said, because the way I make money, the, my business practices, he said, they're probably not compatible with what you're talking about. And I told him, I told him the story of Jacob and Esau, how Esau despised his birthright, and he was willing to sell out his birthright for a bowl of soup. And so I asked him the question, I said, so you're willing to sell out your birthright for just a few extra dollars. And I told him, the word says, if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to me. I don't have to cheat. I don't have to steal. I don't have to mislead people. I don't have to, to swindle or to make the fast. But I can be obedient to God, be sanctified, be in God's will. And you know what? God's going to meet all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's going to do that. You know how he walked away that night? Not unlike the rich young ruler. He walked away sorrowful. He conquered sexual immorality. He conquered drunkenness and drugs. But there's this one thing that he refused to conquer. You know what? 99.9 .9 is not going to do it. He has called you as holy to be holy in all manner of conversation because it's written, be holy because I am holy. I'll give you a couple other questions. How much sin does it take to make something unholy? How much does it take to make something unholy or unclean? Another question I asked a guy the other day. He's talking about, you know, I try hard. He said, I just come out a few days and have a, a few drinks every once in a while, but I work hard and, you know, I take care of my family and all this. And I said, you know what? You have a, a, a wife that you really love, right? And he said, absolutely. And I said, would you, would you take and feed her a teaspoon of arsenic? And he said, no way. I said, well, why not? He said, because it's poison. I said, well, let me let you in on a little secret about arsenic. A teaspoon of arsenic is not going to kill you. It's something that has to be built up in your system over time. And I said, so would you give her a teaspoon of arsenic? He said, I wouldn't give it to her anyway because I know it's poison. And I said, even though it won't kill her immediately? He said, no, because it's poison. Folks, and I told him the same thing. I said, listen, that's exactly what your compromise does. Your compromise tonight may not kill you all at once. Your disobedience tonight may not kill you all at once. Your few beers not, may not turn you into a drunkard overnight or your procrastinating. Whatever it is that, that, that is your struggle may not kill you all at once. But let that stuff build up in your system. And one day you're going to fall over and you say, well, how did that happen? Well, a little leaven, leaven the whole lump and a little fox spoiled the vine. You allowed just that little root. Scripture talks about roots of bitterness that come in 
and they defile many. You allow those things to remain unchecked and unchallenged in your life, what are they going to do? They're going to kill you. So how much does it take? Any of it. Just any unholiness makes what was holy and clean unclean. Let me ask you a question. Can you live holy? Just follow-up question to that. Answer, I'll be obvious. Can you live holy and unholy at the same time? You can't do it. You can't serve two masters. Why? Love one, hate the other, hate the other, and love the one. That he, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so here's, here's, my, here's my next question for you tonight. Would Jesus ever ask you to do something contrary to his will? Never would, would he? I'll ask that again because I want to hear you answer it. I love that answer. Would Jesus ever ask you to do something contrary to his will? Why wouldn't he? Because that would be contrary to his character. He could let no man say, when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God. God would never tempt anybody with anything evil. He'd never ask you to do anything evil. And we know that evil can only function outside of the will of God because that's what evil is. Evil isn't robbing and stealing. Evil is anything that transgresses the righteousness of God. What's the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God is doing what God said. That's what it is. So anything that you do that's outside of that, why? Because anything that's not of faith, the moral conviction, the truthfulness of God is sin. The wages of sin is death. And it need all that just plugs together. And so we know that he would never ask you to do something outside of his will. But think about this for a minute, what Jesus said to the man in John chapter 5, verse 14. God would never tell you to do something, right? It was outside of his will. So here's what he told the man in John 5, 14. He said, Behold, you're now made whole. We've got some saved people in here. You were fractured, you were broken, but he came in and you felt whole. So here's what he told that man that was made whole. He said, Now go and sin no more. Go and don't sin anymore. So what was God's will for that man? That he would not go. That he would go and he wouldn't sin any longer. Okay, here's what Jesus also said to a woman. You know the story caught in adultery in John 8 11. He said, I'm not going to condemn you right now. I'm not going to judge you right now. He said, but now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and don't sin anymore. So what was God's will for both of those people? To be holy. To go and don't sin anymore. To walk sanctified. Now, how is it that in John's time, when he wrote this, 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 this challenging epistle uh, regarding the Gnostics, and how is it that fast forward now, that we teach in churches all across this nation and beyond a message so contrary to that. And so you, t I hear people say all the time that go to go to churches. They they sit in churches all the time and they they claim fellowship and they'll tell you all the time, well, you just can't you can't live holy. You you can't walk above sin. You can't do those things. And so would God ever tell you to do something outside of His will? You already committed to that. You you have to say no. So what is the will of God even? Your sanctification, even that you be holy. And so if I'm walking outside of God's will, I'm walking in what? I'm walking in sin. The wages of sin is dead. It isn't a free pass. It isn't a good old boy. You tried hard enough. It isn't I appreciate your effort or, 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 or your 9 out of 10 ain't bad. Or, you know, you tried. What is it? Outside of God's will is sin. God's will is will always be confirmed through God's Word. God's will is always confirmed through God's Word. Who is Jesus? He's the Word made flesh. So Jesus, the Word of God, speaking the will of God, spoke into two separate lives, just like He speaks into our life. He spoke. So what Jesus spoke to these individuals in regards to His future expectation, expectation concerning their behavior was that they stop sinning, they be holy, or as a result of His intervention in their lives, they live sanctified. So he's saying, listen, I just intervened for you. And so here's my expectation for you. Live holy. Gideon, he intervened for you. He found you wicked. So here's his future expectation for the one that he met in their wickedness. Live holy. Kelsey, he loves you. He intervened for you. For his, so his future expectation for you is to live holy. Dave, he found you. He rescued you. He did not condemn you. He said, take up your bed and walk. His future expectation for you is for you to live holy. Now, that statement is true for everyone in this place that calls upon the name of the Lord. So what is the will of God? What's the will of God for my life? My sanctification. 
Are you in the will of God? Well, if I'm walking sanctified, I'm in the will of God. Well, why aren't you in the out preaching in on the Panama Canal? Well, because that's not the will of God. The will of God is for me to live sanctified. Now, as a sanctified person, you may see me preaching out there. As a sanctified person, you may see me preaching in a nursing home. As a sanctified person, you may see me representing God in the workplace. As a sanctified person, you're going to see me praying. As a sanctified person, I'm going to be a good father. As a sanctified person, I'm going to be a good wife. As a sanctified person, I'm going to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Because the will of God for me is to be sanctified. All those other things that we're talking about are just what sanctified people do. That's just the action of obedience through the person that lives sanctified. I'm doing those things because I am sanctified. I don't do those things to get sanctified. I don't go, God, I don't go preach underneath the cross on Bourbon Street so I'll gain God's favor and gain God's pleasure. I gain those things because I have God's pleasure, and I'm so tickled about the pleasure and the, the favor that I have with God and, and the, the opportunity that, man, I want to get in the middle of a place that has all these people that have not heard about it. So I'm thinking to myself, it was so good to change and transform me from my wicked place my goodness, wouldn't that be the thing that I would want to tell somebody, whether it's there or whether it's at a shopping mall or, or whether it's a, the cubicle the next to me where I work, or whatever that place is, the opportunity God gives me. Man, let me go live sanctified so people can see what the will of God is, that he can change it, that he can wash away my sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I can live that life exemplary in him. Why? Because I am in him. We'll go back just a little bit. Earlier I quoted that first portion, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. It says this, For this is the word of God, even your sanctification. I intentionally left out that next part. Intentionally left it out. Why? So I could bring something back to you. He said, This is the will of God, your sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That you abstain from sexual, sexual immorality. King James, says, I think it says, fornication. So a lot of times people say things like that. They'll say, well, you know, as long as I'm not acting on some sexual urge, then I'm okay with all these lesser sins. Well, pop, let me pop the bubble real quick. Well, that word is, you know, porneo, and here's what it means. Well, yeah, it does mean sexual immorality. But the problem with that is that word for sexual immorality or fornication always also speaks of idolatry. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you abstain even from idolatry. Don't you know what sexual immorality, the root of it is? Idolatry. It's holding something in higher regard. It's having affections towards something more than him. Yeah. The reason that people cheat on someone or have sex outside of the, 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 the realm of, of righteousness in marriage is because of idolatry. They feel like they deserve something. There's a, 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 an urge or something that they feel obligated. They feel uh, morally uh, compulsory to, to fulfill those things. It's all about idolatry. And so anything that puts itself or elevates itself against above God is idolatry. And obviously that would include sexual immorality, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. Keep naming the, the list of those things. But First John 2, 1 through 3. I'm just going to read those three verses today. It says, my little children, here's what, he's, here's what I've been saying, exactly what he's about to say. He said, my little children, the reason that I write to you these things is that so you do not sin. Listen, the reason we laid the foundation for, for eight weeks the reason, the reason we, 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 we've dug so deep and we've, we've stretched, the reason that we've labored this point, the reason that we've, we've talked about all these things and that God's desire, God's will, the reason that we talked about the motivation from these things and the consequence of these things, the, the reason that we're, we're, we're driving the point home is so you will not sin. Because if you do, what's going to happen? It will separate you from that place that God bought for you through the blood of Jesus. And so it's worth it. It's, it's worth having that at the forefront of our mind and our thoughts. It says to ourselves, listen, I don't want to transgress him. Why? Because it will be my iniquity that will separate me from him. It will be my wickedness that will cause him to turn his face from me. He said, I'm telling you these things so you won't see it. Do you not see the consequence of it? I'm telling you, don't play in the street, child, because you'll get ran over. Don't do such and such because it's very dangerous. I know because I've seen the consequence. 
Don't ride that motorcycle without a helmet, or don't you know? Don't drive without. Don't drive too fast without your seatbelt, or don't whatever it is. Don't don't do these things because there's a consequence to it. So John, as a father in the church, is saying, "Listen, guys, little, little children." The first chapter was really heavy, hard hitting, very direct. But he breaks it down. He says, "Children, I want to talk to you. I want to break it down and tell you that." A child without chastening is like a fatherless child. He's like a bastard. I'm chasing you because I love you. Children, I write these things so that you do not sin. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he's the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also the sins of the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his Commandments. You guys taking notes today, I want to give you three things from those three verses in regards to the issue of sanctification. The first thing is just what he says in that first line, verse 1. He says, my little children, these things are right to you that you do not sin. Number one, put expectancy. Expectancy. I write these things that you do not sin. I write these things to tell you what I expect to happen as a result of this. I expect when I give you this, when I write this to you, that as a result of this, you won't sin. Jesus told the man, rise and walk. My expectancy now, because of what I just did, is that you don't sin. He told the woman caught in the act of adultery. He said, listen, the reason I just we just went through that whole thing and made a spectacle to the, the Pharisees, and the reason I'm not judging you now is so that you can leave and not sin. John said, the reason I'm writing you this letter, confronting these heretical teachings that have come into the church, I'm doing this, children. So when you walk away from this, or I'm not around you anymore, that you won't sin, that you'll live holy. That's the expectancy. The second thing is in verse 2, he said, he is the propitiation, or he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's the enablement. So you have the expectancy and the enablement. He said, listen, if you think it's tough, I'm going to tell you how that's going to happen. It's going to happen because... He's your atonement. He's the propitiation. He is that sacrifice that satisfied the wrath of God. He is the one that drunk the cup of suffering so that you don't won't have to. He's the one that, that bore the sins and the iniquities and all of those things that were laid upon him so they won't have to be laid upon us. So you have an enablement. Why? Because you're never going to have to be uh, hung up on a cross. You're never going to have to suffer those things. He suffered the just for the unjust. So there's the enablement. The third thing is, he said, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. There's the evidence. So we have expectancy. We have an enablement. And all those things have got to produce an evidence. Write this down. Expectancy is determined by what is said. Expectancy is determined by what is said. Now, obviously, it depends on who says it, right? So the expectancy that we can take from Jesus when he says something, well, we can rely upon that. Why? Because his word does not pass away. He honors his word even above his name. That's the word of God made flesh. So expectancy is determined by what is said. He said, do not sin. What should I expect? Not to do it. And so if I believe what he said, I can believe that I can do what he said to do. But here's the problem. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. What pleases God? Your sanctification. So if you're not walking sanctified, what does that tell you about yourself? That I'm not walking in faith. I'm not walking in faith, i.e., I'm not walking in the Spirit. Why? Because if I walk in the Spirit, if I walk by faith, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I'm not walking sanctified, I can't expect to walk in, the, in his will. If I'm not walking in his will, that tells me one thing. I really... Don't believe what he said. Amen? You hear people preach, and they go to these prophecy conferences, and what do they always say? Jesus could come back, and all these things are lined up, and all these things, and Jesus is going to split the eastern skies, and all the things, and the, this, this nations are going to rise against nation, and already they're, they signed this document, and we're, we're facing all these type of things. They get all this news, and there's gigantic charts the size of, you know, of, 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 of billboards behind them, and they're putting all these things, and all these people are getting buying up the books and all these things. And they leave, and they all rush to the buffet at Shoney's, and they sit around and chit-chat about where they're going to shop tomorrow in the city they're visiting. Do they really believe that stuff? 
Because if we believed that if any moment he would split the skies and the wrath of God would be poured out upon people, shouldn't we be a little bit more alarmed in our spirit? Shouldn't we say to ourselves, listen, if we believe the prophecy that we're spending big bucks to go to the conferences and we're believing that he's going to come back and the will of God is that none should perish, that all should come repent, shouldn't that motivate something inside of me? Not to sit around and find out what the latest Hal Lindsey book or the, or, the, or the latest whoever the prophet of the time is is, is putting something out. Or, or, or what are, shouldn't there be an urgency in me to warn people to flee the wrath to come? You think so? So what's it tell you? They really don't believe what he said. Enablement, here's your second thing. Enablement is determined, determined by what is done. Enablement is determined by what has been done. That would be the cross. You know why I'm enabled? You know why I can do what I can do? And you can do what you can do? It's because he's already done what he was going to do. Because Jesus died and he rose again. And if we have faith in the finished work of the cross, folks, we talk about faith. I had a guy come up to me just last night, 57-year-old guy from Alexandria. He's got a daughter that's 22 years old. She's in the Marine Corps, stationed right across the river. Probably, she probably passed Gideon sometime over there. Works there, and he came down. He said, listen, I stayed here. My, my, my daughter had some event happening with the Marine Corps, and I just came to visit her. I'm staying at a hotel right up here, and I thought I'd walk through. And he said, I like really what you guys do. He said, but uh, he said, there's some people that, that, that are able to communicate those things. He said, but what I just do, he said, my gift is faith. I'm like, do tell he said, my gift is faith. So what I do, I don't say anything. He said, I just kind of bump into people as I go down the street. And he smiled at me and he said, they get blessed. <laughs> that was a long night, folks, or I probably would have just, be frank with you, I probably would have rolled him completely up. But it had been a long night and I was a little tired. And I thought to myself, really, what good is this going to do? This guy thinks that faith is about bumping into people on Bourbon Street and he said, and they get blessed. 57 years old, been in church for all these years. And really, that's what you came away with? That you're going to bump into people on Bourbon Street in a drunken, and they're in a drunken stupor, and they're going to be blessed? Folks, that's ludicrous is what that is. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. How will they know unless we bump into them? <laughs> Folks, you know what? It would be very, very laughable if it wasn't so indicative of what the church has become. We just got this bump into in Christianity, accidental anointing. You know, folks, I, I said the other day, revival will never happen by accident. Period. It's not like bumping into somebody and them being blessed. It's because our faith isn't in something that we splash around like a, a, a bottle of bubbles. But it's faith in what he said and faith in what he did. My faith resides in what Jesus Christ did upon the cross of Calvary. I believe it. That he was wounded for my transgressions. He was wounded that I might be justified. That's what that means. That the, he died, and so what does it, what happened? I am reconciled back unto the Father. He was wounded for my transgressions. You know what most people do? They run away from the cross at that point. Oh, he, he died for my sins. He died for the sins of the whole world, and they run, run away. But does the word stop there? The word, his will, it says, and he was bruised for my iniquities. That's called sanctification. Those paths of least resistance, those things that represented who we were. He said, listen, I, I just wasn't wounded for your sins, your justification, but I was also bruised to sanctify you, to make you holy in the chastisement of my peace. If your peace was upon me, I was chastised that you might have peace of mind. You might have the mind of Christ. And by my stripes, you'll be healed. Now, my faith is because of what was done. Because no one has ever done that before. 
No, there was never a Savior that died and rose again. So I've got a, ba a bedrock to build upon. Upon this rock, he'll build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why? Because he's the, the rock that cannot be moved. And so my enablement comes from that one that all power is given unto him. Do you hear me? The one that holds the universe in the span of his hand is the same one that has inscribed me on the palm of that same hand. My name is written on the hand of that one that has power over everything. That's my enablement. So when I say I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength, when can I do those things is when I'm in Christ. I can do all things when I'm holy as he is holy. I can do all things when I'm walking in righteousness. I can do all things. I can have that enablement to the greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. When? When I put my faith where faith needs to be put, and that's in the blood of Jesus and the redemptive work of the cross of Calvary, not in the things that I can do or pull off or the headlines that we can grab or any of those things. It's I put my faith in Jesus. And the third thing is the evidence. Expectancy is determined by what is said. Enablement is determined by what is done. Evidence is determined by what is seen. Evidence is determined by what is seen. Verse 3, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. Two young men came up last night. Actually, they were walking by. Uh, Polly grabbed them, and uh, Joshua was standing near me and uh, Dave at the cross. And I heard her talking to him, and I'm like, uh-oh, this I know this is going somewhere. And Joshua turned around and gave me that grin that he, he'll give me sometime. No, but that's about to get ridiculous. And I'm thinking, man, I, I, I like sometimes to be right in the middle of ridiculous. And so I asked Dave, I said, hey, take this real quick. So he took the he took the cross from me, and I, I spun around in front of him with my Bible open because I knew, well, I was going to cut to the chase on this one. There was two guys, and I heard them tell uh, Polly that they were saved. They were Christians. And one was standing there with a shirt that said, drunk one on it, with beads around his neck. And the other one had a shirt that said, drunk two, with beads around his neck and a beer in his hand. And I'm thinking, man, you should have came to the time we weren't teaching in First John because this is a bad night for you guys. <laughs> We're about to bring you back to the will of God. What was interesting, open that the illumination of God's word up. And you could tell initially they got jolted by it. It was like throwing cold water on them. But they could not deny that truth. You just saw the reaction. I know. I, yeah, you're right. And it wasn't the thing where they were trying to, 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 try to weasel their way out. But you could just see that, you know what, they knew they'd been caught. And they said, we needed to hear that. Now, I, I can't tell you where they're going to end up with that, but I can tell you something got injected into that conversation that they didn't know before. Because they felt so comfortable walking up to that 15-foot red cross to this young uh, lady back here and saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're fine. We're, we're Christians. We're, we're cool. But at the end of our conversation, the guy with the brown bottle, long neck of beer in his hand said, man, I don't even want this anymore. I said, that's fine. Let me get rid of it for you. Folks, isn't that the condition of the church? It's not. They don't think there's any evidence necessary in what people see. Folks, the Word of God tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22 to abstain even from the appearance of evil. Why? Because the evidence people are looking for is what they see. Another guy had come up last night. He walked up and was talking to us. And uh, I kind of followed him down the street just a ways and started sharing with him and he, he just began to tell me, listen, I, I, I believe. I, listen, I'm, I'm just carrying this for somebody. And he had a, you know, 18-inch, one of these hand grenade drinks. And I said, well, here's the problem with that. The person seeing you don't know if that's yours or someone else's. They don't know if that's number one or number ten. And I said, what fellowship do you have with those things? Why would you want to be identified with those things any longer? Folks, listen. He gives us commands to come out from among those things, be separate. Don't even touch the unclean thing. He says it's a shame to even speak of those things that they do in darkness. Here's the pres prescription or the prescribed product of sanctification. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16 and 17. Just quoted 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. He just quoted the tail end of it. I'll give you the whole, 
No context. It says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? What I mentioned earlier, listen, what's God's will? Your sanctification. Flee even what? Sexual morality. Idolatry. What agreement is there between the temple of God and not walking sanctified is another way to say that. So how can I say I'm God's temple, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, but still walk in idolatry or catering to my own flesh? For we are the temple of the living God. As God says, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. What's them? Who we used to be. How we used to look. How we used to act. How we used to uh, 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 speak. How we used to do things. How we used to be seen. And be separate, says the Lord. He said, don't even touch an unclean thing, and then I'll receive you. He's not going to receive the unrepentant. And so we say these, just come as you are. Well, you come as you are, but he don't receive you until you repent and believe the gospel. Repentance brings you access up to him. Redemption is what puts you in him. You hear what I'm saying? And so this whole mentality of, you know what, just come as filthy and as, as vile as you are, and he'll receive you. No, he'll receive you when you come up to him in that condition, and you repent, and you're washed clean by his blood, then I will receive you. You hear that? That's the difference. He's not going to invite wickedness into his presence. Folks, that's why we've got to repent, for the kingdom is at hand. His kingdom doesn't come with observation but the kingdom is inside of us. That's where it starts. We come to him. We humble ourselves. We repent. He cleanses us. Now we've been crucified with Christ. We no longer it's us that live, but Christ that lives inside of us. So the expectation is for all that have been justified through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to come out from all of those things. So here's what we're expected to do. And it's what he said to do. He said, be ready. Are you ready? That's Luke 1240. Write it down. Luke 1240. What's the expectation that he has for you? Be ready. I want you to be ready regardless of what the circumstance is. I want you to always be ready. Be ready to give an answer to any man that would ask for you a reason for that hope of glory. Be ready to obey. Be ready to pray. Be ready to, to, to do whatever I've told you to do. Be ready. The second thing that he tells us to do, we'll see this in Colossians 3.15, is to be thankful. Here's his expectation. Are you thankful? Give thanks to the Lord. For he is good, and his love endures forever. Are you thankful? Now, let me ask you a question. Somebody that's close to you hangs out with you. Would they say that what characterizes your conversation is thankfulness? <laughs> My sister said, oh, boy, maybe not last week. <laughs> Are you characterized by being thankful? Do people think about you and they say, man, I'm sorry. Tell you what, man, my sister, man, she's just so thankful. You know, I, I said she just always got the joy, Lord. She's just always just giving thanks to the Lord. I'm thinking, man, she don't even give so much thanks to the Lord. What's wrong with her? She lost her. It's always Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thankful, thankful, thankful. <laughs> well, that's the expectation to be thankful, folks. Listen, do you realize what He's done for us? That's right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Do you really realize what he's done for us? And if he never does anything else and the wheels fall off of everything, do you not realize that we've got the greatest gift in our possession in Christ Jesus now? We don't have a complaint in the world. Why, in this world, he told us, you'll have tribulations. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yeah, you're going to have tribulations. You're going to have afflictions. So why are we shocked when he's already told us that those things are going to happen? And if we avoid a bunch of those, praise God, I'm thankful anyway. But think about what we have. Are you thankful? Well, if you're not thankful, you're not sanctified. And if you're not sanctified, you're not in his will. If everything is mully groves and griping and complaining about your circumstances and situations, you need to get sanctified. That's the will of God. Be transformed. Romans 12, 2, you know that. He said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove or know what is the good and acceptable and perfect Will of God. If your mind's not transformed, if you're not thinking different than you thought when you were lost, you're not being sanctified. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding 
in the Word of God. Uh, is that the evidence of your life? Are you steadfast? Are you steady as she goes? I call it just being born. I want to be born. Kyle asked me yesterday, he said, hey, so what did you do? I said, brother, I'm just, when he said, ask me, what do you do? He said, I said, brother, I'm just, honestly, I'm, I'm really boring. And my wife said, amen. He's like, boring. <laughs> you know, he's ever doing anything. Well, I'm always doing something. It may just not be what anybody else likes to do. You know, I'm always doing something ministry related or reading or studying or something. I, I'm, not, I'm really easily entertained. I'm boring. You see a guy that goes to the streets and preaches stuff and say, well, everybody has got to be more excitable about that. I'm, I'm really not. A, I could care less if everyone went to an amusement park or went fishing or golf. I, I, that don't interest me. I'm boring. Well, excuse me for just being very predictable. I'm just predictable. That's what I'm being. I don't have a problem with that. I'm easy to entertain. Luke 636. He said, be merciful. Are you merciful? I was praying years ago. I may have shared this with you guys early on. As a pastor in Texas, I was praying. The Lord spoke to me. He said, would you be willing on the day of judgment to demonstrate the exact, receive from me, here's what he said, receive from me the exact proportion of mercy that you've given to other people. It took me in the scripture. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. With whatever measure we measure out is what's going to be measured to us. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. Now, he's saying that to us. How do we think we're going to get around that? So part of being sanctified or walking in sanctification is being merciful. Are you merciful to people to the degree that you want to be merciful yourself? Or do you say, well, they should have treated me different. Well, how'd you treat them? Well, it's beside, that's beside the point. Well, they didn't say hi to me. Would you say hi to them? Well, no. Well, they didn't do this for me. Did you do it? No. Once you show mercy, mercy is extending something that someone doesn't deserve. Now, I want to give out in proportion to what's been given to me because I've never received a solitary thing from God that I deserve. Not a thing. So if he gave me everything and I didn't deserve any of it, wouldn't you think that we could give something to people that don't deserve any of it? Be Merciful. Hebrews 13, 5. Another one of these beings. He said, be free from the love of money. And that's tricky even in the church, isn't it? Prosperity teaching, all these things. We can't be obedient to God because all these other monetary things get in the way. Now, you don't have to have money to have the love of money. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to have any money to have the love of money. You know, because probably most of us would be... <laughs> Out of that equation, you know, you don't have to have money to have the love of money. But that's where you put your dependence upon those things that we can do by the, the work of our own hands and the work of our flesh. He said, be free from those things. Why? Because that is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, here's another be that he says in the being sanctified. It's James 5, 8. He said, be patient. Are you patient? Is your patience sanctified? Because patience... Is the fruit of sanctification. That's those things that he said be. If you're going to be obedient to him, be in the will of God, you've got to learn patience. Folks, I, I'll admit, there was a time in my life that I was not patient. Period. I was not. And I get an amen from the amen corner over here. It only takes one. I was an impatient individual. But think about it is, I realized how impatient that I was. I did. I saw that it was contrary to what God said. I couldn't get through the Word of God. I couldn't get through 1 Peter without that just smacking me right in the face. And, and, I, and I despised being that. I despised him pointing that out to me. So what did I do? I repented. And I tell you what, I'm, I consider myself, I don't know why still does, I consider myself abnormally patient. I do. I'm going to be patient. Why? Because I need patience. And so I'm going to be very patient, methodically patient. Wait, 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 wait. See how patient you can be with me tonight. <laughs> That's not patience. That's just me being cruel if I did that. But we've got to learn to be patient. That's what sanctification looks like. 1 Peter 1.16, he said, be holy. 
Peter will mess you up, won't he? Do you be patient? Do you be holy? You know, just like James does. Be holy as he is holy. Not too holy, but be holy. That's kind of like Matthew 5, 48. He said, be perfect as he is perfect. We have them all the time. They don't come to Well, God don't expect me to be perfect. So will God ever tell you something he didn't expect? Well, no. Well, what about Matthew 5, 48? <laughs> it's in red even. <laughs> be perfect. Well, he couldn't mean that. What do you think he was lying or just teasing? <laughs> he don't do either. Amen? He expects that. But if he expects that, back up a step, he enables us to do that. Why? Because he's perfected forever those that are sanctified. John 17, 17. What does he say? Father, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. So we're sanctified. We're made perfect through him. Like Once again, the reliance upon what Jesus did, not by what we do. These, my little children, these things that I write unto you that you do not sin. In other words, he said, I am reintroducing an expectation that should always accompany your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said. He said, I'm going to reintroduce something that was from the beginning. My children, I'm writing these things that you do not sin. Write this down. When standards are lowered, expectations are lost. When standards are lowered, expectations are lost. And so when I when I lower the standard, I no longer have an expectation. One, one of my favorite sports stories is in regards to a, 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 a former Soviet Union pole vaulter. Some of those older guys will remember this by the name of Sergei Bubka. Sergei Bubka is the only, he's the world record holder in the pole vault. He, he's broken the world record, I think, nine or 11 times. And they were all his records. And he's the only one that jumped over this 19 foot threshold. You know why he jumped that high? Because that's how, the, how high the pole was. When the pole was 18 feet, he just jumped a little bit over 18 feet. When it was 18 feet, 6 inches, he just jumped a little bit higher than that. And when he set the world record, it wasn't that he went 2 or 3 foot over. He just barely went over that standard. But folks, you know what? You drop the pole to 10 feet, you know how he would jump? Just a little bit over 10 feet. And so when we lower the standard, we lose the expectation. And so folks, if we're going to raise that standard again, forgetting those things that are behind, that's what Paul did. He, he, he raised the standard. He said, I'm forgetting the things that are behind. What were the things that are behind him? Disappointment, unmet expectations, failures, all those things. He said, now what do I do? I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling, the raised expectations which are in Christ Jesus. If any man sins, not when any man sins, I'm going to wrap it up tonight. We're going to get into the if next week. Folks, listen. Sanctification is recognizing the standard and knowing that God has enabled us to meet that standard. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the night.